Uh, hello, Horimoto is uh, myself. Uh, I have been associated with um, Asian studies, particularly Indian politics, and which makes me um, very much Indianized by myself. <laughs> and that means to say I am quite outspoken, unlike uh, ordinary <laughs> Japanese. Now, my presentation is the, um, quite lengthy, but I try to be a very short one. This is the outline. Number one, current basic structure, China's emergence, hedging and engagement and the regional mechanism and conclusions. By the way, this is a photograph taken uh, in a Bali. When I bought this um, Pacific Ocean, it's a huge ocean, very beautiful. Um, no, no, this is not related to this matter. And then this is um, a map of the uh, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean. And then now, coming to the original point, the uh, current basic structure. Number one is everyone admit this is taking place. Number two, the is a basic power structure of Asia. This is uh, written as the um, uh, kind of the uh, status quo power versus uh, revisionist power. It's it's taking place, and uh, to my understanding, the status quo power might be U.S., Japan, and Australia. And then division power might be China. And India is quite uncertain in my case. Maybe partly, maybe not. I, I'm just, you know, as Governor Narayan told us, that uh, reluctant power. So in that sense, it might be, uh, so it's quite difficult to uh, decide to which category India may belong. And then uh, opaque in case of ASEAN countries. And then, uh, my to my understanding, the India Pacific now is a major kind of battlefield taking place in Asia. The um, as number one, it is um, Kaplan said, a new power center, and then Rajamohan also putting so much stress on the uh, cooperative security grid power concept and so on. And then thirdly, this uh, I could not Professor Yang, how could I read his name? Zhao Nanki, am I right in pronunciation? Uh, the, he said, we can no longer accept Indian Ocean as an Indian only of Indian, an ocean only of India. And then it's what he said. And also, uh, Fu Jintao said, and then um, Defense Court paper is also pointing out India is, Jap China is aiming at a rich country and strong army, and expansion of naval powers. The, the Dionel, the aircraft carrier, is already uh, operated, and so on. And then there is a sort of theoretical argument about the power transition. This Oganski, so many people are talking about how this uh, power transition is taking place. Number one is by uh, this one, that when the challenger has over 80% of capability of dominant nation, it moves to challenge. And in this case, it will be applicable to the United States and China. And then, um, Against this, Joseph and I was talking about the difference between power as a resources and power as a behavior outcome. And then um, this uh, Mesh Maya was very more assertive. The China would not simply write peaceful. So this is a sort of comparison of these um, major powers in Asia, how this um, GDP and defense expenditure is uh, allocated. And now, number two, this is my second point. The China's emergence about the predominant power. I'm simply saying China is a great power, and historically speaking is. And then in the past more than 2,000 years, China has a great power, and then quite dominant in terms of the civilization, in terms of culture, and influence surrounding countries, surrounding areas of East Asia Sea, East Asia also. And then, after that, the China has subjugated the foreign uh, dominations, Europe and Japan, and that makes um, very humiliating for ch Chinese people. Now, in the, this one, uh, the Beijing Olympic and the Shanghai Expo and number two economic power and so on, that makes China has a perception 
of the preponderant power in Asia. That's why, you know, there's a famous um, Chinese um, proverb, two tigers are not necessary on one mountain. And then probably, uh, natural, it will probably, uh, natural, China aspire to establish a hierarchical power structure firstly in Asia. And then, uh, adding to this factor is the China's implementation of predominance. In the gradual fail of the U.S. power, its main thrust looks to the Western Pacific, East Asia, Southeast Asia, coupled with severe measures vis-à-vis -vis Japan. And then I found a very interesting argument the appear uh, given by uh, Mr. Kanwar Shiba, former foreign secretary. And according to his analysis, Chinese activity number one, Chinese activities are all part of strategy to browbeat Japan, obstruct its the emergence as that will pose a challenge to East Asian hegemony that China seeks. Number two, to test the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship by making it appear that Abe is politically adventurous and that his politic, uh, policies can disturb the U.S.-Japan and uh, U.S.-China equilibrium in the making. Thirdly, actual target of Chinese muscle flexing is Americans' forward presence in the Western Pacific because that prevents China from wielding untrammeled power in itself, neighborhood, and it constrains China's neighbor ambitions and so on. This is um, appeared on the Hindu Star Times on January 22nd. Now, understanding in such a way, the, uh, this is my third point, hedging in the Indo-Pacific. The um, first one point is competition of supremacy of Indo-Pacific. And the new type, uh, China's new type of major power relations. And then based on this assumption, plan is expanding, Iceland chain uh, of policies, and stream of powers, and, and so on. And China, U.S. is rebalancing to China, uh, Asia, Clinton's America's Pacific Century, and so on, and TPP and RCEP. And then these are the situations taking place in Asia as a whole. And secondly, in this changing of the scenario of the Asian drama, India's importance is gradually, gradually moving up. The uh, U.S. advocacy of Indo-Pacific means importance of India Ocean and involvement India as its predominant power, put it very simple word, to make use of India in the operation of this policy. And then, uh, to this re in this relation, U.S. strategy, from, to my understanding, Japan in Western Pacific, India in Indian Ocean, reliance on India. As its military capability grow, India will contribute to Asia as a provider of the security in Indian Ocean and beyond. And then the Indian Russia Defense Corporation and so on. And backdrop is quite natural that the U.S. global policy has shifted from war on terror to counter to China. And this is because the national security for a uh, national strategy for counterterrorism has been made public on June 26, and Bin Laden was killed one month before. And then, according to the U.S. understanding perceptions, the war on terror has been completed. Of course, not completely, PACA completed, but somehow completed. And then that's why this time this U.S. policy direction has been changed to the. Uh, Asia. And then, for this purpose, as you may be all knowing about the quadrilateral approach, uh, combination of US, Japan, Australia, and India. And then this has been, you know, so many uh, agreements and so on. And this uh, quadrilateral approach has been, uh, its uh, promoter was Bush, Howard, and um, Koizumi. They have retired. And then there's a strong, very severe objection from China. This quadrilateral approach has been uh, abolished. But instead, the bilateral framework, under the bilateral framework, this squad approach is still going on. And But uh, in that sense, again, it's, uh, India's reluctance or reluctant major power. The, if China perceives India as a irrevocably committed to uh, uh, arm anti-Indian con uh, containing ring, it may end up adopting overtly hostile negative policy toward India, 
rather than making an effort to keep India on the more independent path. This is, um, you know, this um, so-called quasi uh, uh, official report, non alignment 2.0. And then, in this connection, I would like to say one point, one more point. U.S. involvement is required. The indispensability of U.S. Mr. Lee Kanju remarks, fundamentally, it is only barely possible to maintain the Asian balance of power without U.S. And he was pointing out, U.S. is absolutely necessary. And then, uh, there is um, a Chinese uh, very famous uh, foreign policy to maintain a low profile and to bide your time, which is only applicable to the U.S., not other countries. To most of the, uh, the Japanese and Chinese specialists are pointing out this idea is only applicable to, uh, to, to, to U.S., not India, not Japan, no other countries. And in that sense, number two, U.S. as a facilitator between Japan and China. Uh, no military, at the moment, at the moment there is no military or diplomatic hotline between Japan and uh, China. And then crisis management is impossible to do without this hotline. China, India has a hotline in, in local area. But India, Japan, uh, no, China, India, Japan has not such kind of hotlines. So two countries would not want to go to war and instead need a peaceful security environment and promote international trade. But there's a problem. Is U.S. dependable? The um, defense expenditure is now the 40 percent of total of the world, and GDP is 20 percent. And then uh, uh, soon after the Second World War, U.S. GDP was roughly 50 percent. And coming down to the uh, 1990s, coming down to the 25 percent, now further coming down to uh, the 20 percent. Instead of that, still maintain 40% of defense expenditure of the world. That makes America's policy very, um, what shall I say, impracticable. And that's why, you know, these days, for example, Christopher Ray advocates the offshore balancing, put it very uh, simply, that U.S. withdraw from the Asia scene, and instead China will take over just their position. That is what this um, uh, Christopher Ray is advocating. And based on quite similar to his argument is Susan Rice's uh, recent remarks. When it comes to China, we seek to operationalize, this is a key word, operationalize a new model of major power relations and section the people among the China specialists in Japan. Taking this phrase, operationalize, means the U.S. had admitted uh, this, um, this new model of major power relations. And then uh, Hugh White, he was uh, pointing out this fact. As the China grows, Japan has more and more reason to be anxious about uh, China's power. And, and this and this confidence in America's willingness to, to protect it. So that's why, you know, in that way, this uh, Japanese are uh, rather um, in feeding unstable, feeling very insecure in terms of the relationship with the United States. And then another uh, factor is the uh, most important country for U.S. is China, 36 percent, and Japan is 35 percent. This is an opinion poll conducted, commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan into the United States. And this is the first time the uh, uh, 19, uh, 2011, up to that time, always Japan comes first and China comes second. But this 19, uh, 2011 changed the perception of U.S. people toward Asia, China number one. And then also important is uh, ASEAN countries and relevance of ASEAN countries. They have sort of facing a sort of ambivalence the distortion of economy, cross-economic uh, relations with China, but antagonistic security relationship, that's why depending on the U.S. Now, the, uh, this is the final part of my presentation, engagement and regional mechanism. The, I, I, personally, I don't like this uh, idea, hedging and uh, 
egg jing and egg jing, but this, there is no suitable other words. So uh, that's why I'm using this one. But uh, firstly, engagement policy. Uh, the uh, ca uh, suppose we proceed with the engagement policy, China counter measure will be taken, and mutual military expansion and confrontation of uh, atmosphere in Asia. So, and moreover, this hedging policy, hedging only policy, uh, the excellent ammunition for the hardliners in China. And even if there is no such distinction between two schools, enough excuse for more st uh, steamroller policies in Asia. That's why I'm uh, trying to advocate the idea, hedging come engagement policy. Hedging only antagonistic, engagement only is elusive. And engagement should be, I mean to say, inclusive and multilateral. And as a country would find it difficult to become hegemon, and would instead accept cooperation in support of regional framework. So, as far as a regional framework, regional mechanism is concerned, the, in South Asian region, Indian Ocean, there is a lot of mechanism uh, proposed and, uh, you know, the introduced by India, these uh, frameworks. And this has to be more full-fledged in terms of its ability, capability, in making peace and so on. And in Southeast Asia and region, ASEAN and so on is operating. This, this is somehow okay. But the basic issue is East Asia. There's nothing except uh, six party talks. So Japan, China and Japan should hold candid talks about security situation in East Asia China Sea in order to bridge a gap perception, minimize misperception. Uh, uh, build mutual trust and foster common security interest in region. This is uh, the, said by a Chinese scholar teaching in Japan. And of course, one more important thing is the expansion of UN Security uh, Council. And India should be represented in order to have a due representation of regional uh, voice to be heard in the center of the world organization. And conclusion. Uh, the Prime Minister Maman Shin remarked, Japan and India have to work with China to ensure that the peaceful rights of China takes place in a manner which will be conducive to Asian security and Asian prosperity. And then Ichika said, uh, very, you know, in the classic, he said, power transition takes place when there exists a gap between distribution of position, prestige, leadership, and actual distribution of them among the major nations. This is what is happening just now in Asia. So, in the final uh, remarks, I'd like to say this point. Probably a combination of realism and liberalism would be required to cope with the present circumstances in Asia for our future. India's active involvement as a great power is anticipated. This uh, adds, uh, uh, Governor Narayan said, reluctant. I'm always wondering why. Why India is not going to, you know, show its full-fledged power in, you know, to, to, to implement the uh, security and prosperity in, in this area. Thank you very much.